Now, I'm not a reader, but when I saw that a gem of the internet wrote a book, I bought the book. Now, because I haven't actually sat down to read a book in like years, four years, a certain amount of years, I forgot how enjoyable of an art form it is. So while it initially took me a few days to get the motivation to start reading again, once I started, I was immediately hooked. The external cover of the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows feels so polished and good to hold. It's whimsical and mystical, yet dark feeling. And the dark cover symbolizes those feelings you have late at night. Where it could also symbolize the solitude of someone looking up at the stars and pondering about life. If you flip it around, the back cover has example words for people to get the vibe of the book. On first glance of the book, I found it very enjoyable to flip through the pages. I noticed that there were not only John's previous words from his YouTube channel, which is how this project started, but there were also a lot of new words, as well as essays and illustrations. The essays, sometimes, are fully original pieces that haven't made it into the form of videos. And it was a nice way for the book to be portioned between the longer and shorter segments. Whereas all of the illustrations are at the beginning of each chapter is a way to help visualize the author's words and makes all of the illustrations paint the feelings beautifully and perfectly. The videos from the channel make it into book form in the, well, form of essays. Basically control C, control V into book form. It's not exactly the same script, although you can basically glean the same sentiment from either, which makes it a nice integration between the channel and the book. This book will be unique to everyone, because while reading it, you can't help but stop and think about those moments you've had in your life, where you felt these specific feelings. There have been times where I've sent pictures of some of the definitions to my friends simply because they reminded me of them in some way. This book will make you say, same, that's a mood, and then immediately make yourself aware of what you've experienced in your life, whether good, bad, or maybe just a thing that happened. I do recommend taking notes with this sort of book to see how many words you relate to. And if you do, just know that autocorrect might be a pain because I literally one time tried to write the same word about six different times. And so instead of trying to write it for a seventh time, I'm writing this. The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows is a compendium of new words for emotions. John's mission with this book is to give words to feelings that don't have a simplified word for the English language. Starting with the very first section about this book, John lists six example words. Canopsia, desfu, nodus tollens, annulment, onism, and sonder. And yes, I ran out of letters because that happens. He voices his concern that other languages have words for feelings that English doesn't. The dictionary evolves over time, only giving names to concepts that are simple. Emotions are none of these. As a result, there is a huge blind spot in the language of emotion. And then states how even if only one person has a very obscure feeling, this dictionary has its mission to find that word that describes that feeling. It also explains how not all the definitions are sad necessarily, mostly because the term sadness in Latin actually means fullness in some contexts. John describes how these six words are categorized by six different themes, which I think is a subtle nod to the six example words from earlier. The outer worlds, the inner self, the people you know, the people you don't know, the passage of time, and the search for meaning. Chapter one was good. I like when the essays tied in popular characters and tropes to make a point about our real world. The fact that chapter one was about a general sense of the world makes it a good introductory chapter of the six chapter book. Out of the 41 words, I related to 20 of them. My favorites of this chapter were definitely the Ozuri essay and the word Volander, which is the feeling of looking down at the world through an airplane window. For each chapter, I'm going to showcase some highlighted words instead of, you know, reading every single one. Some of the words that stood out to me in this chapter were Ozuri, Chrysalism, Rukinrungru, and Funkenswagvorstellung. John, what the frick? 
This was the first chapter where I started coming up with my own words. And some of these words I felt the exact opposite of. I have a lot more moments of going back and forth as to whether or not I felt some of these words. Honestly, I feel like I related to a lot more words in this chapter than any of the other chapters I've read so far. So two chapters. Out of the two chapters, this was the one that I related to the most. Favorites of this chapter are me starting to come up with my own words and the mentions of Icarus in Kudoclasm. I related to 30 out of the 55 words. Some of these highlighted words are as follows. Theadne, Desante, Adelworth, Pavism, 1202, and McFeely. McFeely sounds like a Tony Hawk pro skater trick. Nice, dude. Oh gosh, I'm still recording. Of course I am! I feel like I've related to almost all of the words in this chapter, which is ironic considering I barely have any friends. I didn't have a lot of specific examples in this chapter, only a few words that I had stronger reactions to. The only real memorable things for me personally was that it had a lot to do with partners and the people that you know in your life, which had me thinking about my own family and friends. I related to 35 out of the 57 words in this chapter. Words I want to highlight are as follows. Look aback, phalasia, and mauer bauer tower kite. How the frick do you pronounce this word? At this point, I started to notice that more and more words already existed, but now have new meanings. Like starstruck in layman's terms. Oh, there's this cool hot celebrity out on the block. And I'm so starstruck that he that he, he's so hot. Oh my god. John's definition instead is exhausted by endless reviews and secondhand impressions. Covalent bond. Now this is some some nerd stuff, some sign stuff. I don't know anything about this. John's definition of covalent bond instead, a moment of sudden involvement in a stranger's personal life. And anti-aliasing, curiosity about real flesh and blood people behind internet usernames. And the thing that I always mess with because my computer just can't stream newer games. Although I've been streaming the dice game instead of my own game show on Spotify and everywhere. Go listen to it now. I work freaking hard on that. I related to 27 out of the 53. It was a section that had me thinking about the world generally and how I've interacted with it personally. Now, if you realize that I'm talking faster, it's because my uh, camera's at one bar, so I should probably stop recording right now so I can save the footage. The words I did relate to are some of the following. Monochopsis. Hey, I made a song about this years ago. It's not bad, I've done better. Like in my new music. Hey, I'm on Spotify, I do music now. No, shut up! I don't care! New album coming out soon. If it's not out now, it will be soon. <laughs> Wasn't even in the freaking script. Whatever. Route wash. Lockheartedness. Silience. Scour. Scrow. Aftergloom. Hobsmack. Mal de cuckoo. Mal de cuckoo. Mal de coco. Coco puffs. Finally, Ledsum. I had to separate this chapter into several different reading sessions. I related to 36 out of 58. A handful of these that I thought would be worth mentioning are these. Zeno, Zine, straining my eyes. Xenocene, kite, apprise, appraise, pithered, present tense. Pithered. Wait, didn't I already say that? At first, I felt like this wasn't one that I would relate to a lot. Similar to Boats Against the Current, except this chapter is more about spectating the external meaning rather than the internal meaning. I relate it to 22 out of 46 meanings. Here are six of them. More tourism. Irishin. Eftless. Caranoia. Nadro. Fo. Hold on. Nadrophobia. Upon, up, upon the, Aponema. John ponders the question, are these words real or are these words made up? Once he started sharing these words to the public, he started to ponder the initial question. His word, Sonder, 
was one that caught a lot of attention. Which honestly reminds me when modern day slang words make it into the dictionary, such as yeet. A word is only real if you want it to be. Okay. He mentions how no one really knows what the O and the K stand for, how all words are made up, how language is both a blessing and a curse, how making this book altered his perception on language, how ambido was one of the hardest definitions for John to make clear, and that he recommends the practice of inventing new words to pin down whatever it is you are feeling. This is the chapter where John shows how thankful he is by literally thanking everyone for supporting this endeavor. He thinks his wife, daughter, teachers, editors, agents, illustrators, sources, family, and friends, his college writing group, the readers, and his emailers who shared their stories. Not a big or long chapter considering it's literally three pages long, but I do like this chapter purely because it shows that this project was not only cheered on by his loved ones, but by the random people that shared their stories. Ollie Ollie Oxen Free. What does this mean? Well, according to Wikipedia, who still wants me to donate, Ollie Ollie Oxen Free is an unknown origin truce term used in children's games such as hide and seek, capture the flag, and kick the can to indicate that players who are hiding can come out in the opening without losing the game, that the position of the sides in the game has changed, or that the game is entirely over. Basically, kids play kids game, and kid gives a grace period to hiders, or teams switch sides, or if a game is over, or if you're a Spartan from Halo. This chapter is a list of all the words in this book. Every single one. 316 words. Since I've been taking notes this whole time, as I recommended you did, I related to 170 out of the 316 words. Which means the grade I get for my current life experiences is a 53.5, which is an F. Yeah, that sounds about right. After I read the book, I started wondering, how can one man come up with 316 words? So I went back through the book and tried to look at any clue I could find. John mostly will have an origin at the bottom of the definition. After hours of calculating the origins of each definition, so like two hours, out of the 42 categories that I organized for word origins, four of these categories are ones that John used most often. These would be the origins of Latin, Greek, action, and state of being. As you can tell, most of these words are opposites of John's word, except Thrain. Now, if we use the trends that John used to come up with his words, we can base them off the previous Latin, Greek, action, and state of being origins. For the sake of time, let's rework the previous words. Instead of false holding, we'll use the Latin word for sharing, communicatio, and the Greek word for art, artem. Artem unicato, the act of sharing an amazing discovery to the world. Which means this is now the only official Artem Unicato channel on YouTube. Now, let's figure out a better word for anti-fitching. So let's use the Latin word for feeling, affectum, and the Greek word for arc, techni, techni fectum, when art makes you feel good. Lastly, thrain. In Latin, question is kiesto, and in Greek, station is stamos, as in you're questioning how your thoughts stopped at the fictional train station in your mind. So, we get quemos, when you question how you got to the end of your train of thought, yet not knowing how you got there. So now, I am officially the origin of Arta Municato, the act of sharing an amazing discovery to the world. Techni factum, when art makes you feel good. And quemos, when you question how you got to the end of your train of thought, yet not knowing how you got there, as if time skipped forward without your awareness. Feel free to use any of these words and cite either this video or one of three clips that I will upload on the second channel, in case you need credibility for like an essay or something, I don't know. After all, all words are made up, according to John. 
before we get to the conclusion, the one perspective I haven't gotten is from everybody else who had thoughts about this book. It has hit the number one bestseller in award list on Amazon. Speaking of Amazon, the reviews are extremely positive. I want to see the bad reviews. At one star and one review, it was too small for my taste and too pricey because of that reason. I love how they literally spelled too wrong the first time and then spelled it right the second time but didn't correct it the first time. That's funny. I assume they mean the size of the book which personally, I like the smaller look to it. He claims it's too pricey when it was only $15 for the hardcover. And there are cheaper options such as the Kindle version for $5 cheaper or the free version if you have a Audible trial. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm a nobody, so nobody is sponsoring this video. I also forgot to mention this, but apparently if you sign up for Simon & Schuster's email list, you can get a free ebook, so I'm just saying you could probably get this book for free, so thank you for watching this far. Next is the two three-star reviews. The first review was a gripe at how cheaply made the material of the book was, which made them say the price point was not worth it, which, Instead of arguing against this point, I'm going to let the Library of Alexandria make her case about this very topic. It's cheaply made. The cover board feels hollow, actually. And the material that goes over top of it, it's a textured paper to mimic cloth. It's a magnet for fingerprints, but if the text had been embossed or the image had been embossed, I think that would have been really wonderful as well. We can see that there is a headband, but that there was a lot of glue used, but that kind of tells me that it isn't actually sewn. It won't last very long, and the paper, very textured and porous. It almost feels pulpy, not acid-free, so the pages are going to yellow. You can see the text on the other side. This book isn't going to stand the test of time, and I think that it's deserving of a collector's edition. Also, yes, I want a high-quality collector's edition as well. The second three-star review bore her quickly, since it was in the form of a dictionary. I do agree that this book takes several different reading sessions, but I don't believe it's boring due to how much variety that this book had. Third person had to pay 10 euro tax to the postman. Well, that's not really John's fault that people have to pay international shipping on Amazon. <laughs> this book took me 11 days to finish. Each chapter took about two hours to read. Taking notes honestly helped a lot which I highly recommend you do because this book has really made me thankful for all of my current life experiences despite my failing grade. Because there's a very nice conclusive feeling you get when you know a word is based on something you've actually felt in your life. Now, I have really learned to appreciate the more silent moments in life. Like I've literally spent 76,566 minutes in 2021 listening to Spotify, which is 97% more than other listeners in the US alone. Music is nice and all, but maybe more of my time should be spent in the quiet rather than the loud. This is my favorite book published in 2021. On the outside, it's got this mystical, spacious cover. Get it? Because you can literally see space because of the stars. On the inside, a world of new possibilities and their meanings. You can just imagine yourself in these stories if you relate to them on any sort of level. It made me think differently about the world. How small our worldview actually is. How time can impact anything how many strangers that we've passed will be forever forgotten by our short-term subconscious. There's so much to learn about our world, so let's create new words for feelings or observations we've made, yet haven't given the chance to invent them ourselves. Because like John, we could help so many by sharing merely a word of encouragement.